from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And we have another great author here for you. Patrick Carmen is an inspiration to anyone who dreams of getting published. His first book, The Dark Hills Divide, began as a bedtime story for his two daughters. When Carmen self-published it, the fantasy tale took off, selling more than 10,000 copies and earning the attention of Scholastic, which recognized a hit and published this first book in the Land of Elian trilogy. Soon it was on the bestseller list. Other bestsellers followed, not just the rest of the trilogy, but the other series, Atherton and Elliot's Park. Earlier this year, Carmen pushed toward, forward on a new front, multimedia publishing. He released Skeleton Creek, which is a multimedia ghost story, and his latest book is part of the future of publishing. The Black Circle is the newest adventure in the multimedia series, The 39 Clues. But Carmen is more than his books. He is a guy who writes well and does good. By doing good, I mean he's been spreading literacy throughout the world by donating his time and all kinds of books to kids in poor rural areas. It's his, it's his belief that illiteracy and poverty go hand in hand. Learn to read and all sorts of good things will follow. Please join, in, join me in welcoming Patrick Carmen. I know you guys are all here to get out of the rain. I know it. And it stopped raining, so you can, you can run away if you have to. I, um, this is a great, you guys, such a great honor to be here. I'm having a, a, a great day. Um, and I'm debuting my new vest. <laughs> my new sweater vest. I got it real quickly. I don't... I don't actually ask my wife. I hardly ever buy clothes. So it's a big deal when I go buy a, a new vest. And uh, I had kind of a big like media week this last week. I was on the Martha Stewart show and on the Today Show. And I thought, I better go out and buy some clothes. So I went out and I bought this vest. And then I looked at the fine print, which said, no patterns. Like, no patterns on TV at all. You can't do that. So now I'm wearing it here for the first time. And I think they're actually filming this, too. So I can't win with this thing. And maybe this will be the last time that I wear my, my sweater vest. Um, well, look, I've written a lot of traditional novels and series. Some of you know about the Land of Elion books and the Atherton books. And, and lately, though, I've been writing a lot of, um, I guess what I would call multimedia books. I go to a lot of schools. I've been to almost 800 schools in the last six years. And so that's a lot. And I see a lot of young people, especially in middle school and like fifth grade around there, that they just sort of, it's not that they don't like books but there's just an awful lot of distractions out there. You know, they're just everywhere. And so I started thinking about technology in a different way and how we might be able to recraft it to sort of help us get more readers, not have fewer readers. Um, and that's how I got involved in the 39 Clues Project, which very, very quickly, because you probably just heard it from Mr. Riordan, you know, this is 10 books, it's got collectible trading cards and an online game, okay? So as a distracted kid, I would have loved that. It's like using technology to draw us back into the stories and into books, okay? And Skeleton Creek is a similar thing. It's like a book and a movie at the same time. So this is one where it's a ghost story where one character is a writer, and he writes this journal, and that's the book. And there's another character, his best friend. She doesn't like to write. She likes to go out with a camera and film everything. So she's like a little filmmaker. So you read like 25 or 30 pages, then you stop. There's a page with a password. You go online, you put the password in, and you watch part of the story like a movie. And then you go back to the book, and you go back and forth. Well, you can imagine that adults are very, this is very disarming for them. <laughs> so, so, but kids totally get it, right? Kids understand. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm doing my homework, and I'm listening to my iPod, and I'm on the computer. Anyway, I might as well make it into a story. So these are, these are like lifelines. The way to think of this, I think, is either these are ways to go into the sort of wired kid world and drag them out and put their face in a book. Okay, still, I feel like, you know, because I've done a couple of those in a row, those kinds of multimedia projects, it might seem like I don't like traditional books anymore. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So I'm actually going to prove it. I'm going to tell you a little tiny five-minute story about how I got in big trouble in the fourth grade. 
And for all you kids out there, fourth grade is when I got in tons of trouble. Um, and I'm going to prove to you that I still love and treasure traditional books, okay? Because there's, there's a little magic trick that I'll actually do at the end of this story. All right, we'll all get to participate in a cool little magic trick. Okay, so when I was in the fourth grade, I was a really late bloomer. I was a little tiny fourth grader. I'm six feet, four inches tall now. It all happened in about the eighth grade. I was this little tiny guy. And my best friend, whose name was Gary, he was really little too. And here's the weird thing about Gary, though. Gary had a huge head of hair. So you have to imagine a little kid whose hair is bigger than he is. There's like this little tiny kid, this huge head of hair. Like you'd see him from down the street, and he looks just like a Barbie, like a Barbie doll with a bowling ball for a head. That's what this kid looked like. And I love Gary with the big hair. Me and Gary with the big hair were two little kids, big, huge neighborhood, and we would protect each other and sort of wander around, me and Gary with the big hair. And we would buy the same toy. We'd buy one of the same toy because we were good at destroying toys. And we had this one that we got called a Stretch Armstrong. <laughs> now, obviously, the kids are all, want the Stretch Armstrong, right? The adults are like, the Stretch Armstrong. <laughs> right? Come on. This is like almost as good as evil can evil. All right, so for those of you that don't know, it's about that big. It's like a little pro wrestler. He's got the little underwear on and the whole bit. And if you grab one of his arms and you grab one of his legs and you just start pulling, he stretches like a lot. You could stretch him like six feet. And then when you let go, he goes like this. He goes, like that. And you cannot pull this guy apart. And me and Gary with the big hair, we had a plan. We were going to be the first two kids ever to rip this toy in half. That was, that was the only reason we bought it, was to tear it in half. And so we went down to the Kmart, poured all of our money out on the counter, we got the Stretch Armstrong. And we brought it home, and for about an hour, we pulled, and we pulled, and we tried to tear this thing in half. This is a tough little dude. I mean, we couldn't do it. So we looked at it, and we thought, it's time for the heavy artillery, right? <laughs> So, whoa, watch your hand there, buddy. He's too close to the stage. All right, so we, he just kept going back to his normal size. So we took a rope, and we tied a rope to Stretch Armstrong's arm. And then we tied the rope to the mailbox post in front of my house. And then we had a much longer rope, and we tied that to the Stretch Armstrong's leg and tied that rope to the back of Gary's bike. <laughs> this is a true story. And we used to love daring each other, right? We didn't have... We didn't have bike helmets back then. Not that I remember, anyway. If they had them, my parents didn't, didn't buy them. But we did have this old football helmet. So if anybody was going to, like, jump off the roof of the house or, you know, jump out in the road or whatever, we'd put the football helmet on first. And so we put the helmet on Gary with the big hair. And you can imagine. It's like parting the hair sea to get to his face, right? There's just hair everywhere. Put the helmet on him. And we had this great big sloping driveway. And we got Gary up there on his bike, and he took off. There's the rope. There's the guy in the middle, and there's the rope attached to my house, basically. And he took off down the driveway, and it was so amazing. It was like a giant rubber band. For about six, seven feet, it was like, burn. And he got slower and slower until he was almost to the middle of our cul-de-sac, and he was reaching so hard. It's like the back wheels are going spinning, right? And finally, the bike just goes Phew! right back where it came from. And it went right, it's a lot of metal a bike, right? And it hit my mail, this is my mailbox post, and it hit my mailbox, just clobbered my mailbox. And I looked out in the road, because Gary didn't come with the bike. <laughs> He's just laying out there in the cul-de-sac, flat on the pavement, staring, at the, laughing his head off. He thought it was hilarious, right? We're like, okay, good, he's fine. And, but my mailbox, it, the door was kind of hanging off a little funny. It's got this huge ding in the side of the mailbox. It's, we practically destroyed the mailbox. And so as quick as we could, we untied this guy, and we left the rope, the long rope, attached to his leg because we had a plan about it was like we were going to lasso him. and Anyway, but we didn't get to that because we could hear my mom. My mom, we could hear. My mom had a slug bug. Back in the 70s, she had a little Volkswagen, and we could hear it coming through the neighborhood, and we're like, oh, my God, my mom's coming home. And so we're trying to hide the thing, and we're standing in front of the mailbox like two little tiny guys. Our heads barely come to the mailbox, right? We're just standing there. My mom pulls up into the driveway. She gets out of the slug bug. And she looked at us both, and she goes, who busted the mailbox? <laughs> and I'll tell you, when you're little, you, there's something you can almost always say. We just stood there, and we got as little as we could, right? 
She's like, who busted the mailbox? And we go, what? <laughs> Which actually is an excellent answer when you think about it. Because we weren't really lying. We were just confused. <laughs> She's like, who broke the mailbox? And we're like, what? If you say it a couple times and your mom's in a rush, she's like, just get, go break somebody else's stuff. Get out of here. Like back in the 70s, they just go, don't come back till dinner, just leave. <laughs> My mom goes in the house and we still had the guy. We couldn't rip this guy apart. So we said, Gary, it was his idea. He goes, let's stuff it under the back wheel of your mom's car. <laughs> we'll stick it under there. And when she rolls over, his head will go and it'll, his head will blow off. It'll be perfect. We don't need to rip him apart. We'll just blow his head off. So we stuffed it underneath the back wheel of the car, and we got the rope, and we're back and behind this, like, bushes by the side of the house, just sitting there waiting. My mom comes out. She gets in the car. And she starts the car. She rolls over it. Boom, boom. And then Gary with the big hair, right? You can practically see his hair over the hedge. It's that big. Gary with the big hair, he goes, meow. <laughs> just like my mom had run over a cat. It was incredible, right? And so then he, and he pulls the toy back out. He pulls the stretch arms arm into the bushes. And my mom gets out of the car. She slams the brake. She's like, oh, my God. Did I just run over a cat? <laughs> and me and Gary, we're back behind the hedge laughing our heads off. I mean, we're just rolling around in the dirt until we looked up. And my mom, <laughs> she's like looking down over the hedge. And she goes, give me that toy. <laughs> the toy had a, a, like a tire tread mark across its chest. It was totally fine. The head was fine. The body was fine. This thing will not die. <laughs> My mom took the toy. We got it back about a week later after a lot of begging, and we cut him open. <laughs> we couldn't stand it anymore. Just so you know, a lot of red, goopy, weird stuff pours out of him. That's, that's what's in there. doesn't taste very good. Because <laughs> we did. We dared each other with spoons. We're like, I dare you to drink it. Gary's like, I dare you. <laughs> right? So it's whole back and forth. I dare you. So we went and we got two little spoons and we loaded up on this red goop. And we just sat there. And Gary's like, come on. And he got a little too close. And I went, <laughs> just like that. And then we're rolling around in it and Gary with the big hair. All right, here's the magic trick. You guys, if I could invent a camera, this would be the coolest camera ever. I could invent a camera that could take a picture of what everybody in here, all of us, what we all think Gary with the big hair looks like. And we could take all those pictures and develop them and put them all right here, like a whole wall of Gary's. Here's the weirdest thing ever. There wouldn't be a single set of Gary with the big hair twins. Right? Every single one would be different. And that right there, that's why I love books so much. I, I treasure books so much because you can't do that any other way. When you read a book, next time you go to the library, if you're, if you're a kid or a teen, you go to the library, you grab a book out of the library. That thing maybe been checked out 500 times. But here's the cool thing. It's going to be super different and special for you. It'll only happen one time for you like it's going to happen for you. You're like the director of your own story. When you open up a book, you see it. You make up what everybody looks like. It's all about you, really. Okay? So remember that when you pick up books. All right, so that, this whole thing with me about doing these multi-platform things it's all about just kids are distracted. What you can probably imagine, I was a very distracted little kid. It didn't matter what you put in front of me. I fell under all of its spells. It's like Evil Knievel, The Brady Bunch, Gilligan's Island, Batman and Robin, the Atari 64. <laughs> what a moment. Asteroid. Oh, my gosh. I was so just, I mean, it's like, oh, look, something shiny. Right? I mean, it didn't take anything for me to just get distracted. If I'd have had something like this, okay, because I was a late reader. If I'd have had a 39 Clues project, right, with tr trading cards and, and online games and stuff, I would have actually, I think I'd have read that book, and I think I'd have loved it. If I'd have had a book that could connect me to a movie and I could go back and forth, look, yeah, they're going to watch an hour. It's like a TV show, but they're also going to read 200 pages. All right, we need to think about how we can recraft technology, not so it's our enemy, but so we can use it to get more kids reading more pages. Okay, that's, that's why I do these kind of projects, to get more kids reading books. All right. So I think that's got to be 20 minutes at least. And I don't want to not leave time for questions. And if you have any questions for Mr. Riordan, I will try to answer them. <laughs> because I know he missed his chance. 
and I know him. He's a super, super amazing, nice, creative, amazing gentleman, and I know he would have loved to do that. So I will try, and I do know some things that uh, if you have questions about the 39 clues, I may be able to answer for you. So I think we got a couple of mics. Maybe is that how this works? And we maybe have five, ten minutes. We can we can do a few questions. Anybody? I've got, is that how? The, should I? Uh, did I do that right? <laughs> maybe I should just hold the mic in somebody's face. Yeah, let's just do that. How long did it take you to write um, the your 39 clues? Okay, how long did it take for me to write my 39 clues book? I'm going to actually add to your question and say, I get this question all the time. What's it like inheriting characters instead of making them up? So writing it took me a while. It took me about six months to do the whole thing because I've never been to Russia, so I had to, I had to research it. Um, so that took a long time, actually. Thankfully, we have somebody at Scholastic who lived there for two years, an amazing editor of these books, and so she could like, fact-check everything. So if I said that like the Catherine Palace was made out of cheese... If I said, it's a cheese palace, and I put it in the book, she'd be like, no, it's not. <laughs> and so she caught all my little mistakes. It was great. I could put whatever I wanted to in there. So uh, a lot of research, so it took time. As far as the inheriting characters, look, you guys, Rick Riordan made up these characters. <laughs> That's the first thing you got to realize. And every author since has done such a great job developing the world of this story. It was a pleasure to show up and take Dan and Amy, these two characters, into Russia and do whatever I wanted to them. So I got a lot of freedom to, to make them grow in different ways and, and see them along on their journey. But I, I love the fact that they were developed. I don't know that I would do it again, but I, I had a great time doing it. So, um, I was wondering um, how many books are in the 39 Clues series? I'm only two books in so far. Excellent. How many books are there in the 39 Clues question? I think it's funny that I'm actually leaning towards her. <laughs> the speaker's like right there. I'll just start leaning like this. All right. How many books? There are going to be 10 books, okay? And they're written by a total of seven writers. So some of them are going to write two. I'm not going to write two. Mine is the number, the fifth one, which is the one that's out now, the newest one, The Black Circle, which takes place in Russia. Each book is in a different country, okay? That's, that's how it works. They, they're traveling all over the world looking for these 39 clues. I'm assuming that Rick told you guys some about, about the series. I don't need to explain that. Who, should I show a hand? Should I give you two seconds on what the story is? All right, I'm going to make this quick because I know a lot of you know, but... Imagine showing up for the reading of a will. Two kids, Dan and Amy Cahill, they show up for the reading of a will, okay? And their, their beloved grandmother has just died a little while ago, and she left this will. And when they show up for the funeral, lots of people there, not this many, but a lot. And they don't expect that, all right? And they're given a choice. They can either have a million dollars cash. So imagine if I stood here and I said, you guys can all have a million dollars each. But if I give it to you, you got to walk away and never come back. Or you can have, this was the choice, you can have the first of 39 clues. And if you can be the first one to find all the clues scattered out all over the world, you'll be like the most powerful person on the planet. That's basically, it's like this amazing thing that you get. And these two kids, they take the first clue and they send them off on their adventure, and that's how it begins. Okay, so we're going through the countries, and now we're in, we're in Russia. Okay, great question. You, you, if you have your hand up and you have one, I think they want you to go to the mic. Um, so if you, you know, if you, if you can snake your way through there, we'll, we'll love to try and get your question. Yeah. What was your inspiration for Yikes in the Land of Elyon? My inspiration for, the, for Alexa? Yikes. The little oh, the little guy Yipes in the, uh, in the Land of Elyon. I wrote a series called The Land of Elyon. It's kind of like the little engine that could. It just keeps going. I mean, I've, there's five books in the series, and then there's a girl in the series that she tells a story. It's a fantasy series. And there's a little tiny guy named Yipes in this story. I have no idea where that came from. I really wish I could give you a better answer than that. I, I, he, he was somebody who sort of lived in the world and sort of out in the, in the mountains and stuff, and I thought it'd be cool if he was little. I don't know why I thought that. He's got a little mustache. He's got a little hat. And the Yipes thing, I like to try and come up with names that are hard to forget, so I thought that was kind of hard to forget, Yipes. So that worked. These are such lame answers. I'm going to do better. I'm going to make them shorter, and they're better. All right, that was the, that was the last one of those. Um, what, who is your favorite character in the 39 Clues series, and what was your favorite scene to write in the fifth? Okay, that is a good question. There are two, these two, Dan and Amy Cahill, and Dan is one of those, he's sort of a smart mouth, right? He thinks he's pretty clever and pretty funny, and he kind of is a little bit, and he eats a lot of junk food, and he loves to collect weird stuff. That's me. <laughs> I'm not sure if I would have loved him, we'd like have been total friends, or we'd have been like mortal enemies, 
when we were, if we were in school at the same time, I think we probably would have been pals. But here's the weirdest thing. I actually really like uh, Hamilton Holt. Uh, the hammer, I call him. I don't know if I coined the hammer or who did, but, but this is a kind of a big, you meet him and you think, okay, so this is a big, dumb guy. And I've always thought that big, dumb guys are more interesting than they look, <laughs> right? That, that there's always a lot more going on than you think there is. So it was so funny. And they tend to be kind of funny. I think Hamilton Holt, this character, is really funny. So he's probably my favorite character to write. Yeah, it'd be him. Okay, next guy in line. Oh, boy, this looks good. Um, do you know what might be happening for the next 39 Clues book? The next 39 Clues book. I think I can tell you. If I can't, they'll yell right now and tell me, don't say that. Uh, it's going to be in Australia. The sixth book oh. is In Too Deep. Jude Watson, the, the lady that wrote the fourth one, she's going to write the sixth one. And so that comes out pretty soon, maybe a month, not too long. It'll be, it'll be coming out, okay? Don't ask me for any of the clues because I can't tell you those, unless you're of a certain branch of the family that I'm in. <laughs> Anybody a Lucian in here? For those of you that don't know what that means, well, you're not in the fraternity, I guess. All right, the Lucians come see me afterwards. I'll tell you the whole story. Right down to the end. All right. I really want to be a writer when I grow up, and do you have any tips for young writers? Tips for young writers. Well, I always love getting that question, and I'm glad that you want to keep writing. I have two tips for you. The first one is obvious, read. And here's why you want to read, okay? You don't realize it, but when you read a book, a ton of cool stuff is happening in your brain. Okay, when you, so imagine you read a sentence, and there's like a little thing called a comma, it's a little like swirly thing called a comma like that. You ever seen one of those? A little, little thing like that? Okay, you've seen one. All right, every time you see one of those in a sentence, your brain says, I get it, that's where it goes. And if you see a word while you're reading and you're like, I have no idea what that word is. Authors tend to use the same words over and over again, and you'll see it again. I just keep going, because pretty soon, you'll just know what that word means. So reading gets you all kinds of great benefits about what you need to be a writer. But I also suggest this, tell a story once in a while. All right, when you go home, a lot of you kids, when you go home from school on Monday, instead of saying to your parents, when they say this, when they say, what did you do today? Don't say, nothing. <laughs> right? Don't do that. Unless you can say it for a whole minute. Okay? Try really hard to go home. I'll give every kid in here an assignment on Monday. You go home from school, and if one of your parents says, what did you do today? Try for one minute to actually tell them what you did. Because when you do that, you like give details and you tell them like some little story about what happened to you and a friend. That is the only thing missing from being a writer is a pencil and a piece of paper. All the same stuff happens when you come up and you say and you remember and do details. So that's what you do. Okay? Thank you. All right, cool. If you were Amy or Dan, would you have took the million dollars or... Would I have taken the dough? <laughs> That's a super tough question and because I know what they're going to get, and it's awesome. <laughs> but, but if I hadn't have known, I still think I would have taken the clue because I, I, have, I, what's, I have what's called wonderlust. I love to travel. So I probably would have spent the million on travel anyway. <laughs> Might as well just do it looking for clues. I probably would have taken the clue. Thank you. Okay. Um, where is Gary today? Where is Gary today? Well, I can tell you this, he's bald. <laughs> totally bald. Incredible. No, seriously, this thing was like, it's like we would be at school and people would stick pencils in there, like put wads of paper in there. He'd come home with like a garbage Christmas tree on top of his head. He loved it. He'd like, you didn't want to stand too close when he shook his head. He'd be like, vroom, vroom. right? Stuff would fly all over the place. I actually, this is the truth, I haven't seen Gary in forever. You know, you guys live in a time when it's really easy to stay connected. When I was a kid, uh, we, we were really good friends for like th two, three years, and then he moved to the other side of town. I kind of lost touch with Gary, but I probably shouldn't find him because he's going to want a royalty. <laughs> he's going to want some dough. I'm almost sure of it. So I'll probably sign some books for his kids or something. Are there kids over here? Am I missing anything? We're good. I'm, okay, maybe I'll take the question here, but I'll face that way. I don't feel so bad. Is there going to be a 39 Clues that is going to take place in China? Uh, uh oh, somebody from Scholastic just said, do not say. So yeah, but no. <laughs> Actually there is, but not no, no. I can't really I can't really say. I'm sorry. I can only reveal Australia. And Australia's cool. 
Um, what inspired you to write about Alexa and her adventures? Okay, so this is, again, we're talking about the land of Elion. This was the only story that I ever wrote that I really, truly did write for my own, my own kids. Um, everything else I really feel like I wrote for, for all kids, but that one story, The Dark Hills Divide, it began as a story that I told them, and then it just got so big that we couldn't keep it in the house anymore. We had to let it out, <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's the, the, really the inspiration for those stories was to tell something to my own children. All right. It's okay if we keep going. I don't want to, I'm sure you guys are waiting for this wimpy dude to come up here. So I don't want to cut into his, I mean, I could probably beat him up. I could stay up here all day if I wanted to, but I don't want to cut into his time. So it's good. Keep going. So I'm sure someone will tell me. Oh, I feel like I'm at a wrestling match. It's like five minutes. Hello. Looks like round five, round five. All right, we got five minutes. What inspired you to um, think about the stones that, uh, happened to make Alexa speak to animals. Okay, wow, we got a lot of Land of Elion fans. That's super. He's asking about, there's a stone uh, in the Land of Elion stories. They're very rare, but if you get a hold of one, then you can under this understand the language of animals for a while. So it's one of those things, if you get a stone and you go out into the woods, like out into the wild, um, it'll work. But as soon as you go back into the city, it stops working and it'll never work again. So it's kind of a fun idea when you think, I was thinking of it in terms of like, well, if you could go out into the wild... And you could really actually understand what animals said. But you had to make a choice. It's like, well, as soon as I go back to the city and go back with people and cars and stuff, it's over. I'll never be able to hear that again. So it was a, an idea of trying to set up a sort of a choice that you had to make. So I don't know what inspired me, but that's how I came up with it. Good, good question. If you, if you were Amy and Dan's au pair, what would you do if you, if you, would you stay with them the whole time or would you leave them? If I was, if I were Dan and Amy's au pair, there's a, there's a character in the 39 Clues who's kind of like their nanny. He goes around with them. She wears like a, or, uh, she uses an iPod and she's like constantly listening to music and practically losing the kids all the time. And would I leave them if I were her? Like let them go, like leave them behind? Um, I don't know. Probably, I guess. I'd probably go looking for the clues myself because I'd want the power. Or I'd pro I probably would have just taken the money at the beginning if I were her. I don't know what I would have done. But it's a good question. Thanks. I think I, can you walk up there to the, you want to walk? If anybody has a question with their hand up, maybe go up there if you can. There's a little microphone so everybody can hear. All right, go ahead. Why is it 10 books, but it's called The 39 Clues? Wow, that's a good question. I can't tell you how many times people have said, it's kind of a big commitment, 39 books. Unless they're like brochures, right? 39 brochures. Um, that's, you know, I don't, I, they, I don't know how, why they did it at the beginning that way. But I'll tell you, there are 10 books and there's one clue in each of the 10 books. Okay, that's how the clues get parsed out in the books. You read a book, you get a clue. The rest of the clues are all in the game. So if you want to go to 39clues.com, it's super simple. You go there. You sign up, they put you in one of these branches of the family, and then you get to go on missions to find the rest of them. So actually what's interesting is a lot of kids who are doing this, there's hundreds of thousands of kids, by the way, all across the world that are doing this, okay? You're actually ahead of them. A lot of times you know more than the characters do. And by the time we get to the end, all of the 39 clues will have been released into the, either the game or the books, okay? So that's, that's how it works. Thank you. Yeah. One that's not a magic trick and two, uh, what? You can't come over to my house and play, buddy, never. <laughs> and by the way, I'm putting the helmet on you next. We're gonna throw you off the top of the tent. <laughs> and two, what's your favorite book? My favorite book ever? Yes. Hmm. Uh, here's it, I get this a lot. All authors get this. Well, who's your favorite writer? What was your favorite book when you were a little kid? What's your favorite book now? I'm complicating, I'm, I'm stalling while I'm thinking of what this is gonna be. <laughs> uh, my favorite book when I was a kid, my first favorite book was Where the Wild Things Are. Uh -huh. That was the Ooh. first time I had lots of pictures, I liked the pictures, and I was completely like into that book, and now they're doing this movie, which will be really fun, I have two minutes. And so that was my first favorite book. I, I also grew up around the time when Dr. Seuss was incredibly popular. Um, this book, The Lorax by Dr. Seuss, was one of my favorites when I was a kid. In fact, I do not have a tattoo, and I'm never getting one. But I always tell my daughter, if I ever did get a tattoo, I'd get the little truffle tree from the Lorax. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you this. What was the question? 
question was, oh, the books, the books. Probably my favorite book, though, is probably The Lord of the Rings. It's the only series. I don't know. You know what? Here's a, this guy was committed, you know, and it shows. I don't know, 20-some years he spent all on the same big story, and it shows, you know. It's the only time I've ever written, written an or, uh, read an entire story, and when I got to the end, I turned around and I started all over again. It was just that good. And so I just, I love the, that it's a fully realized, amazing world. They're be it's be books are better than the movies, and that's saying something. All right, I think Thanks. we just ran out of time. You guys have been amazing. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.